she's perfect. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Lauren. With me are three of the greatest writers in America right now. And we're going to talk about a couple of things, but mainly their amazing work for theater for young audiences, which just to make it simple, we'll call TYA from this point on. Um, Lauren Gunderson pronouns she, her, hers. Um, so yeah, I would love to, let's just go around, say who we are, and um, I'll brag on you for a little bit, and then we'll talk about theater for young audiences. Jacqueline, would you start? I think we need to unmute. <laughs> yep. Yep. Trying go. not to cough in your ear. <laughs> uh, Jacqueline Goldfinger, my pronouns are she, they, and you can just call me Jackie. Awesome. Thanks, Jackie. Idris, would you do it? Hi, Idris Goodwin. He, him, his. And then the wonderful Karen. And Karen Zacarias, uh, she, hers, hers. Awesome. So the reason why I wanted to gather um, you, uh, partly because we've gotten a lot of questions about writing theater for young audiences, how it works, how you do it, what are the, the ways to rethink this form, what are all the the crazy ways that the misconceptions about what it is um, and what it's for, but particularly because the three of you represent um, iconic voices in the American theater, um, just master classes of form um, for the, the normal main stage, put it up at the arena and that Oregon Shakespeare Festival and you know major theaters, major stages, major theaters, major plays. And you have this ability to write for theater free audiences as well. Um, so I love that already that pops the kind of myth that theater for young audiences is a kind of less than a freshman thing to do, a side thing, um, instead of for me, um, and the one of the reasons that I do it too is, and I did it before I had kids, um, <laughs> is it's fundamental. It's we are creating the first time that many kids go to the theater, they see these plays. And so creating lifelong lovers and supporters of theater. Um, so I wanna talk about all those things. How do you take all of the great work that you do um, uh, and the award-winning careers that you have and turn it into theater free audiences? Is it different, is the process different for you? Um, how do you start thinking about these plays? What are the, the differences between writing for young audiences or for families and for normal main stage audiences? Um, so we can talk about all of it, but perhaps I'd love to start um, by going uh, into some of the plays that you've written for theater for young audiences, like a little bit about them and just to kind of tell us some about that part of your, your career. Karen, would you mind starting? No, it'd be a, be a pleasure. Um, so I have loved writing for TYA. I was the artistic, the founder and artistic director of a, a theater company that still exists here in Washington, D.C. called Young Playwrights Theater. And what Young Playwrights Theater does is we uh, teach kids how to write plays, to find their voice and put things on and we get uh, professional actors to do the plays written by children um, and young adults. What became um, obvious is there were not a lot of plays that were relevant to kids, to my students living in Washington, D.C. that dealt with all of the aspects and all the confusing aspects of being a kid. And that's what kind of brought me into TYA. And there's uh, such great theater companies that were taking chances on young writers uh, back in the day by putting on original work. And I think that's that's something that's been, been an interesting um, chasm in um, TYA is original plays and musicals and then adaptations. Yeah, um, yeah. And I've done both and I love both, but they both have a different place in, um, in the canon per se. And uh, as someone who moved to this country when I was 10 years old, uh, that idea of being an outsider, of feeling like a kid, of feeling very strong emotions inside and trying to manage them is something that I can access very easily. And I do believe children's theater should give kids the tools to navigate the world, not just escape it. So uh, that was kind of the thinking that I put into my work for TYA. That's so awesome. Idris, what about you? Um, so in like, 2004-ish, I got a um, grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to be a playwright in residence at a theater company. And the theater that I chose to work with was, is a theater called Free Street in Chicago. Free Street um, 
I believe is like one of the first, had some of the, uh, either the first or the most racially integrated cast um, in the city. And they were in, and they were a theater company, a community-based theater company in a park building uh, on the uh, west, uh, west side of Chicago, northwest side of Chicago. And, um, and have been around since the 60s. And over the years had, had uh, become a theater company that worked with um, young people um, from you know, at-risk neighborhoods, um, uh, but you know, kids around that area. And the idea was to devise work, to get those kids using theater techniques to tell their own story, not necessarily getting those kids to do pre-scripted work. So uh, my very first experience, and I was pretty young, I was, a, I was a baby playwright myself at the time, but what was cool is I got to work with teenagers mostly um, to, to create plays in a collaborative format. And that's where I started. I didn't even know what, that what I was doing was called EYA or Children's Series or whatever. Um, it just was like, you know, and so that was my first foray. The, the, the point at which I found out that what I was doing had a name was uh, around the same time I got commissioned by Steppenwolf's uh, Theater for Young Audiences uh, to write a play with my friend Kevin Koval about uh, graffiti writers um, in Chicago and this real event that happened where a group of graffiti writers uh, threw up a, a mural, a 50 foot mural in a snowstorm in March on the side of the modern wing of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and so we wrote that for, and then at the same time, I wrote a play about the young life of Muhammad Ali growing up in Louisville, Kentucky for stage one family theater, where I was um, just formerly the uh, artistic director. Um, and so those plays opened around the same time and were running around the same time. Um, I, it was, uh, so real quick, and I, I don't want to belabor this all day, but it, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, because th this goes to the thing about like, when did, when did I realize that what I, that was what TYA was? Up to that point, I'm like, I'm just the guy writing plays. Like, what's, what's the job? What kind of suit do you want? How many <laughs> buttons? You know, um, the, 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 the play about graffiti writers, uh, there were some critics who were like, this is inappropriate, essentially, this is inappropriate for teenagers. And I was like, what do you mean this is inappropriate for teenagers? Romeo and Juliet commit suicide at the end of that play. And, and I read that when I was in high school, <laughs> you know, <laughs> before, Z before like Zanny hip hop and all that, like y'all was, was propagating like young suicide. <laughs> but then on the flip side, uh, I went and saw, when I saw my Muhammad Ali play uh, being shown to like 500 kids and seeing how they reacted to it, that's when it hit me. That's when it hit me. It was it was the combination of that's not appropriate for that audience, because we presume to know what kids what's appropriate for them, um, but also seeing the positive side to that. That's when I was like, oh, this is different. This is the 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 reaction and the and the rules here, the context, the way that the information is is received and presented is different. Jackie, why don't you tell us about your forays into theater for audience and kind of how, how you came to it. Sure. I didn't know much about TYA. I, I grew up in a part of the rural South where we didn't have, you know, drama programs and things. Um, but when I was in my early 20s, I fell in love with the man who had become my husband and he had a young daughter. And so I became a stepmom at like 23. <laughs> like it was very exciting to a five year old. And um, you know, I started going to shows with her just because like I was a theater person and that's what I did. And they were terrible. <laughs> like the writing was terrible. The characters were like a little pervy. Um, like Karen was saying, like I'm also a believer in, um, and I've learned this from reading all of Karen's work too, like these should teach you how to cope with the world. And a, and a lot of the plays we saw taught really bad coping skills and really unhealthy habits. Um, so I was not happy. So I stopped taking her to the theater for a long time. And we built a puppet theater in our apartment where we were living at the time. And we made our own puppet theater. And we had a great time. Um, to that end, today she is a very popular graphic designer who I'm like, all of her graphic designs look a little like puppetry. So I like to take <laughs> a little bit of credit for that. Um, but what happened was I uh, was also, I started out as a dramaturg. Um, if you don't know what that is, you can check out the Drunk Dramaturgy podcast. 
<laughs> uh, which just covered in an episode of what a dramaturg is. Um, but uh, I was a dramaturg and I was working at North Coast Rep in uh, Southern California. And they needed a Christmas carol that was family friendly and that fit the members of their company and they couldn't find one. And so the artistic director's like, well, you write a little on the side. And I, I, I was, it wasn't great, but I was writing some. And he's like, why don't you do an adaptation for us? So it went really well. I had the opportunity to, I read a slew of TYA plays and figured out like, was saying there tends to be a narrow boundary, unfortunately, at some theaters about what is or is appropriate for kids. And I would agree that, I would argue that we could widen those boundaries significantly because kids yeah. are, really smart and and a lot they're exposed to a lot of things especially online now when they're young and they need to learn how to cope with it when they're young um but I did so I started through adaptation and all but one of my TYA plays are adaptation it kind of took off people really liked that and I think one of the reasons they like my adaptation is because what I look for is I maintain the soul of the story I try and look for what was the author's intent and what is really the heart of the story but I, I take my freedom to revise around it um, for today's audience and today's families. I just want to like, we can open the space for a moment to talk about terrible TYA that maybe we have seen. Cause I similarly took my kids to a few and was like, what is happening? <laughs> and yes. it's amazing how weirdly unprogressive it can be in terms of gender roles, all the girls just want to talk about kissing the boy. And it's just like, how, what? Really? Come on. So I, I, I might have drugged my boys out of one, <laughs> one play <laughs> once. Um, oh, I definitely have. There was one where it was like she had to give her grandpa a kiss in order to do something. And I'm like, no, we're, we're not saying that little girls have to kiss anyone that they don't want to. Like, <laughs> this is not... My Come on. Like really bad coping mechanisms yeah. is a lot more teaching. And then it's because see... it's a throwaway. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, sorry to cut you off, but it's because it's, for a long time it was considered throwaway. It was throwaway. like, oh, you just need to entertain these kids. So, hey, what kind of animal costumes we got back there? Okay, we got a monkey hat and the, okay, just go and like juggle and like, you know what I mean? It was, it was throwaway. It was just like kids will eat up anything. Um, Real quick, I'd be remiss if I didn't just bring it up too, as we're having this conversation and on this tip about, you know, I think the chasm of time between, you know, there was a there was a, a period in time where there were these people like the, the Moses uh, Goldbergs, the, the Susan Zeters, who were like these real pioneers in it. And then there was sort of a, 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 a time of where things kind of like chilled. And then there's this sort of new newer push and generation um, they recently put out a study, the NEA did a study, uh, a pretty comprehensive study of, of theater for young audiences. And it was the first one of its kind in like many decades. And that just got published, that just got released, um, which has a lot of, you know, this conversation that we're having right now. So I just want to encourage, you know, the millions of people that are viewing this right now. They're like, yo, T, I never knew that. Um, that it, it's really dope. I mean, it just dropped. It's actually a really cool read. It's I, I assume everyone on here is also just as excited about data and statistics and infographics as I am. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so I throw that out there. Yeah, and Ed Shockley, who was a leader in the TYA movement back in the 70s and 80s, doing really great on the Edge stuff, just got the Lifetime Achievement Award in, from the Philly Theater oh. Community. So yeah. I think it's actually the work is starting to be acknowledged, yeah. like with the TCG survey and other Oh, panels. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's worth it's great. that. And there's both a national community, like with New Vision, New Voices, and a lot of other um, uh, development programs, plus there's a global community of children's um, and TYA work that I think a lot of people are not even aware with, that there are theaters, from, uh, theaters that, are, that do work for young people all over the world gather every couple of years to share um, what they're doing. So that's, it's, 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 it's a little bit more of a phenomena and you're right, it used to be a throwaway. It used to be like, oh, here are the leftovers. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I think one, one thing I want to bring up that's something that you talked about, Karen, is what is possible in theater for young audiences and really anything. I mean, we, you're so right, Jackie, that kids, especially now, are getting a lot of messages, a lot of crises that they need language and need to understand how to process these feelings. And of course, theater being the great tool 
for society building and and empathy and congregation that it is allow it gives us that. So you know when I when I was approached, I, most of the theater for young audiences that I've done have been musicals. Um, I've done one adaptation. Um, and then two originals and all of them have science in them. And so of course getting that, like, I mean, can we, can we talk about solar fusion, you know, for <laughs> first graders? And I'm like, I don't know, let's try. And then write a song with the amazing Brian Laudermilk. I mean, yes, those kids walk out of that sing theater singing about literally solar fusion. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you can do all things. Um, and you can talk about death. You can talk about politics. You can talk about the real things that if, they're not gonna learn how to talk. If theater isn't a safe space for those things, then what the hell is it for? It's not entertainment. You can go online and watch a Paw Patrol, but like <laughs> theater has a place that has to, I think, teach kids not only uh, you know, context, but the, the, the content is like, you're, you're able to deal with this. You are able to have an opinion about this. I wanna hear your opinion about it. Um, so have y'all had, in terms of the, the stories that you're writing, what are the kind of, big ideas that you have explored in your theater for young audiences that kind of touches on that? Well, uh, there's there's a couple of things that are going on in every single play. And I know Jacqueline and Idris have this too, that when you're writing it, you realize that there's different ages in the audience. So this idea of, of inclusivity, that um, that's also about age, you know, it's not just gender, it's not just race, but also age. Mm -hmm. um, that certain jokes are for the as they are a gift for the parents, and certain <laughs> jokes are for for other people. So I love that mm -hmm. idea of weaving that in together. But you know, I have a play about uh, um, Albert Einstein having a really bad day um, and finding out the theory of relativity that I wrote. With, I mean, I'd be remiss to not bring up Debbie Wicks Lapuma, who's been my longtime collaborator and composer on all of that. And then we did an adaptation of Oliver Twist, set in Brazil with the street children. And what was interesting in that was was that um, when it came to the murder of Nancy, we stopped the play. Uh -huh. mm. We stopped the play and the audience, the Oliver, the, the character playing Oliver, who was a little girl was like, why, why is this happening right now? Why does this have to happen? And they were able to stop the story and not have her die. And mm. so that idea that that you can have a voice in literature. What, what is this death teaching you? And why does it have to happen? Why are we watching this abuse of this young woman? Um, and it was, it was electrifying to be in that theater and have kids be shouting, no, 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 uh -huh. you know? And we, 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 she didn't die, right? And our Oliver Twist, we made as a society a choice that we didn't think that she should be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I think that type of thing can be, you know, life-changing for a lot of kids. And the idea of agency um, is the most important one. All of my plays, and I think what all of us are talking about is, is no matter what the subject is, you're looking at it from the point of view of a young person. So it's not just a play about a young person, it's a play that sees like the world from a young person's perspective. And I think that's what makes a difference than other pieces. Mm. That's right. Yeah, Susan Zeter always says, she says, I don't write for young people, I write about young people. Yeah, I would have, go ahead. Uh, I, I just, I would agree. It's really interesting. I'm doing an adaptation of A Wind in the Door, which is follow-up to Madeline Ellingold's Wrinkle in Time. So the second book, same characters, new adventure, and um, first stage adaptation. And the reason it's the first stage adaptation of it, I think, is because of the fact that the ideas are so big. They're it's huge. They're about uh, being able that no matter what your size is, you can impact things. So she has the characters, they go to the universe and they create an impact. And then they go literally inside Charles Wallace's mitochondria, inside his body and help convince one of the mitochondria to do something to make him healthier. And so like, it's, it's entirely inside, outside that you have more control over the world and you have agency. Um, and I think that that is wonderful, especially in a world where now kids do have so many options that they need to understand they can say no or yes, or maybe, or walk away in a way that I think that they may not have had to in the past. And you know, um, that makes me think about, I mean, what stopping the play does and what, this impossible journey that you can put on the stage yeah. 
it makes it about theater. And there is something even radical for today's kids of going, this isn't a movie. This isn't a TV show. Theater is different. Let me show you why. Because you can stop the show, save the girl's mm-hmm. life, and pick it up and keep going. <laughs> like you can yes. interact when my when one of my characters is, of course, a dog. Turns out we <laughs> were using the dog costume that <laughs> Adri's referenced earlier. Um, and you know, the dog asks you a question and needs you to help with this, this, this experiment. And all the audience does the experiment together. And then we go back. Like that's a thing that tells kids teaches in that theater is different and is a live here, now, you, us, this kind of thing, instead of a, like, rewind it while I go pee kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, no, I think, <laughs> I think that um, that's actually something kind of innate in them. And I think that's actually what they have to teach us as theater makers. I think over the years, as we get older and we get more um, uh, self, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just, just like more um, self-aware and more, um, Insecure is not the right word, but we just, we become very self-aware. And so we don't just, we, the, you know, kids' willingness to engage and, and, and engage in a very real, like, wow, I am very interested in this and this is my whole world right now. And of course, if you stop the play, I'm with you. Of course, if you talk to me, I'm gonna talk to you. Like, it's when we get older, we grow out of that. We grow into this sort of like, like I, I'm not supposed to, the performers are performing. <laughs> here they, they'd be doing this even if we weren't here right <laughs> and and that's that's what I dig is that like to me like that's um we I, so I wrote this play for this plays at home thing um and uh I wrote this play so my kid my son uh he does not like when we're at the dinner table and he's not involved in the conversation um and when and I don't Apparently, I can get long-winded. I don't know, Karen, why they <laughs> hate me like this. But um, so when when my time is up, when I've spoken too long, he will just be like, "Okay, that's, that's enough of this guy. Like, <laughs> like who's ready to talk Harry Potter with me? Okay, I've got some, you know." Um, so I wrote this play. I wrote this like thing where like, and I'm and I'm thinking about this more. Like I'm now like I'm now obsessed with with dinner like dinner conversation and like how you facilitate dinner conversation and uh so I wrote this play where like you know it's four people and it can be of any age and you're supposed to do it while you're eating and uh and and my son like and I and I and I'm like if if, if he's engaged and he likes it then this play is going to work like if my seven-year-old is engaged with this and, and so now we got, you know, my mother-in-law who's in her 50s and my, and my son who's, who's seven engaged. And then the, and yesterday, and this is like one of those moments that feels really good, is he was like, hey, let's do that play again. It's like, you know, he's like, hey, man, enough talk. Come with that play, though. Um, so, but, that, but that's what I mean. Like, like that, that's what I, that's something that I wish that, this, that is something that I, I, for my crusade is that I want all of theaters who understand is ultimately like children are a part of our lives they're a part of our families and you have to consider them i think it was it was uh karen you said this where there's some there's levels to it right like ultimately we want a story that it's just a story and it can function and it's ageless and whatever like a good a story is a story is a story i mean the pixar people know this you know what i mean like there's something yeah and it grows and as they grow up it means different things like you know all that you know so um you know i i see this movement really as a movement as as a, as a real intentional like arts movement that is about expectation and it is about um the role like why we do this and what it's for and the the role of story period like aside from these boxes and labels because really what we're saying is that like oh this is like educational and this is like you know this is for the youth you know what i mean like this is not this is not for like the you know the the adults in their you know coats and their scarves and you know what i'm saying and the chandeliers and all of that like that is serious that's serious story but this and i'm like no, it's it's I, I I don't I don't I don't I don't think so. Like if you can't rock my seven year old, like my seven year old doesn't. My seven year old has the best taste. If my seven year old is not rocking with 
what you're doing, then you need to just throw away everything that you do and start over. <laughs> It's, it's interesting because there is theater for young audiences that's specifically yeah. like, this is a family play. It's 45 minutes to an hour. There's probably some singing. There's, you know, there's that d design for a family, something to do on a Saturday afternoon, sure. What was interesting and kind of broke my brain about theater for young, young audiences is there's also, because wait, uh, I did an ad one of my adaptations, I don't do a ton of them, but I just did one of Peter Pan for Shakespeare Theater Company, who of course had never ever done a play that would be appropriate for anyone under eight. <laughs> like just don't, it's Hamlet, it's big plays, it's Shaw. It's like, no, they're not gonna go. Absolutely, they're not gonna go to there. <laughs> but this, they, uh, the new artistic director, Simon Godwin was like, well, this is what we do with the National. We have a big play that's like a real ass play but one that you, yes, you can bring your five, six, seven, all of, you know. Yes. And that kind of made me think like, oh, right. There is a different kind of theater for young, young audiences that really just means theater for all. You can just go and you can bring it and you will be shocked that your six-year-old will not want to leave at intermission and not make too much noise because if it's gripping, if it's great theater, if they know what's going on and who to care about, a young person is gonna, gonna jam. Like my, my little kiddos were like, in it, the line, they saw the Lion King on Broadway, and I was like, "All right, if if we if we need to bail at intermission, we'll just say that's the end of the play, and it's fine." And they were like, "We're not leaving." I'm sorry, sure. Simba has not completed his arc. We need to <laughs> see this. <laughs> so, like, they, in some ways, if you think that it's like not not good enough for kids, maybe it's just not good. <laughs> like, the kids are going to tell you straight up. I mean, and there's, is there's this good? A re there's a reverse of that, in that kids are not polite, right? Yes. Grown ups, yeah. grown -ups right. will. will listen to your play and be like oh and they will not uh, often ab admit to boredom uh, which i think is the, the antithesis of theater and um a kid will still hear them when they start scribbling around so i have found that my work for young people has actually really helped um give it kind of mas muscularity to my work for uh, adults mm -hmm. in a sense and i've also come to like miss the reaction that my plays for young people get uh, and want that for my adult audiences because yes. um i go to plays and there's no there's no feedback from the, it's just at the end people no clap. Life. and yeah. i love it when people gasp in a play or do this or laugh or spontaneously clap like that is why you're part of a community and that's what happens. And so I've started to try to push my adult work to be to go in that direction too. That is, it'd be so engaging that you have to gasp um, right. in some way. At yes. the end of Peter Pan, Captain Hook is going down. You know, spoiler, this is what we, we did. Didn't <laughs> He's at the, you know, at, at the lip of the ship and no, no, no. And there is a little girl front row who is bawling, who was just like, no, he's gonna die. I mean, going, oh, just histrionics. And then, you know, her mom was so embarrassed and was like, oh my God, no. And I was like, no, that's correct. She's about to watch a person die. Yes, freak out. And then afterwards, yeah. the, the, some, one of the ushers, the, the admins came up to her and was like, are you okay? And she was like, that was, amazing <laughs> like she just she wanted to it's like a, she's a big feeler so like feel big yeah. this is great it's what theater is for yeah. so yes i totally yeah. agree i i love when an audience can like go for it i don't know it's <laughs> the, really redisco the rediscovery of the journey that you don't have to sit back and judge that you can mm -hmm. just be in the story and you can be with the characters like in adult audiences, like theaters are trying to find their way back to that for adult audiences, whether it's mm -hmm. Dominique Morisot's program right. note in all of her New York shows or Long Wharf. Long Wharf now has playwrights write. Um, we write like, this is how you should respond to the show. If you laugh, that's great. Or, you know, whatever you want to say to the audience. But like, we're having to teach adult audiences how to be more like kid audiences. Yeah, right. Because the kid can audiences I, are broach, better audiences, which is so interesting. Yeah, yeah, you dreamed that. A controversial question. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't that like kind of sad though? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. sad. the playwright wrote the play for Christ's sake. Like, they gotta also tell you how to your grown ass how to act. Come on now, what is going <laughs> yeah. on? What the deuce? It yeah, is, I, that, but that it's is true. But I, but but listen, ain't no theater right. I mean, like you know, I mean, this is the time. This is the time. Like, what if, what if, when it come back, it looks more like a, you know, I did this panel with sports people, 
and the and the whole panel was me just saying, man, y'all got it made over there in sports. Like, y'all, you, you know, people can come, people have a good time, they want to go. They, and, and and somebody was like, well, you know, when I go to sports, you know, I can I can have a I can have a beer if I want. <laughs> it was all about choice, but it was all about choice. It was about engage. It was about I can root for my team. I can dress up like members of my team, and they're watching theater. It's it's all theater. Let's okay. like, it's yes. theater. Okay, it's theater in the round, and they got costumes. You know, there's 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 chorus. You know, there's a chorus. You know, Jordan for three. You know, what I mean, it's the same thing, but they just they but they the the rules that they're the the construction of it is so much better because it's engaging and it doesn't sacrifice the story or the drama or none of that. And so, my challenge to theater, like with this point, which is like. If, if Dominic Mariso has to tell you how to how to be real, how to connect with art, has to tell you how to do that, that that is something we got to like look at and, and crack open. Um, and really like, where does that come from? Like, what is this? What is where does this come from? This politeness, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's because it's taught what's that. that about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And also I, not I mean, judging how other people react to it. I think was what, what I took away from her experience yes. is being like, if somebody next to you is hooting and hollering and having a great time and like making their opinion known, welcome, thank you, fine. Like you can, you can experience it in, in your own way. But, and also I will say that was my entire drunk dramaturgy episode, which they're going to release sometime today, I think with me comparing it to sports. I know I don't seem like the sportiest kind of person maybe perhaps you've ever met, but I was like, here is why sport is great theater. Theater, not great sport. Sport, great theater. <laughs> yeah, no, they're killing us. They got a maze. <laughs> However, I will say this though. I will say this though. Uh, uh, we are much more supportive though when our players choose to like take a knee and stuff like that. I will give it that. That's true. That. That's true. Now, did all of you write theater for young audiences before you had kids, or what is your relationship to your own kids and your work? I find that my kids. Um, are really good audience members. So I, I find that I didn't start writing TYA before I had kids, but I found that if I'll read something and like they're off wandering, they're off, they'll be like, no, we don't want to see that. Don't put that in the play, mama. Fix it. <laughs> or I'm like, here are three jokes. And I give them three jokes and then they laugh at one. I'm like, that's the joke that goes in that scene. <laughs> that? Um, that they are, they are terrific audience members and their terrific sounding boards. Mm -hmm. um, I did two adaptations of Little Mermaid. I did one for ages nine and up and I did one for ages under nine because I just learned from my kids that like that story strikes significantly different chords in those two separate age groups. Mm -hmm. And in the younger age group, it's way too scary. So in the younger age group, we have it one sister telling it to the other sister and then they act it out with their family so that they to calm them down during a stormy night safe yeah and it's safe and then for the other group for the older group it's more of the real story and so it's also been a good gauge of like okay where do i need to take out some of the scary stuff where does the scary stuff work where does and i ended up writing two adaptations because we just developmentally they needed two different stories mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Idris, what about your kids? You wrote before, during, after, after, obviously after. <laughs> uh, so no, I, I didn't have any kids when I was doing the work at Free Street. I, I still was a, a baby, my, my dang self. Um, uh, my twenties were pretty much just like an extension of my teens, essentially. Um, and then uh, when I wrote those other two shows, that was like when, like around when my, when my first son was like a baby. Um, and so what's really dope is that now he's seven and, and very sophisticated. And now like my writing is so much better, you know, like especially my TYA, my TYA stuff is like so much better because I, I because I'm around a kid. I'm around a kid all the time. And uh, my wife is a writer too. And so story like we, and my, my mother-in-law is a painter. So it's just like constant creativity and imagination and story going on all the time. And he says stuff that I'm like, oh my God, like that's a bar and a half and I'm stealing that. And don't you get you, you you live in my house, you eat my food, so all the content you create is mine, but you come at me later. You're like Disney. 
Yeah, like low key. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. I'm black, I'm black Walt Disney. <laughs> Not Kanye West. Hey! Cut and friends. <laughs> Karen, what about you? Were you well, writing? You know, my first kids? kids were my students. So I was in my mm. 20s when I wrote The Magical Pinata, which is about, oh. where I remember an uh, imagination stage. Like if we put birthday in it, we'll have birthday parties come. And, you know, it, it was wow. that. And it's still being done to this day. Elena Velasco just did a, and the, also the idea of, of starting with idea of diversity and uh, bringing in new stories to the stage that not everything had to be Alice in Wonderland done a certain way. The idea of not only doing a gender fluid performances, but also mixing it up, but also original work um, because there weren't a lot of books that were about Latino culture or African-American mm -hmm. culture that were specific for kids. Um, and so we started to do original work and that was very, very exciting as well. Um, now there's a lot more books and there's a lot more different plays. And, and you know, the, the idea of adaptation is, is uh, I did a, an adaptation of Ella Enchanted, which is for older, uh, mm -hmm older kids, um, but it was fascinating to take something that's been a book and then it's been a movie that was very different from the book and try to find the world in between using six actors, right? So that's the other thing is the limitations that you get from theater that have to activate your, uh, your imagination. What you were saying, Jackie, about still honoring the source material, the voice and the purpose, like why does that source material exist. Um, so then my kids started going and that was really fun. And like yours, they have definite opinions about what works and uh, what doesn't work, but they're all, they're teenagers now. So they're now opting towards the older stuff. But I mean, all of us have been traumatized or remember a moment of seeing something at the theater or at the movies that you were like, I mean, for me, it was Bambi, right? Uh, Right, the death of, of uh, and, and I'm glad I saw it, but it, it was this mind boggling um, amount of, of, of learning. And so trying to do work that's age appropriate yet pushing people towards honest emotions is something that we deal with a lot in TYA. And so much mythology and, you know, uh, things that we've inherited, stories that feel very fundamental are terrifying. <laughs> I, I'd say, Christmas Carol, scary. yes. Christmas, I mean, Christmas Carol, actually, like, look, I know everybody does it, but I remember going and I was like, what the F is this? This is horrifying. Ghost. This is a right. ghost story. And there's like dead 20. kids. What, what, what does this yeah. have to do with Christmas? So, you know, fast forward later, when, let, let's write some new Christmas stories to tell. But, but even as a question? kid. No. Oh, I'm sorry, please keep going. No, 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 I'm, I, I could rant all day about why, how perfect. Why, why uh, ghosts have changed, like, what? What, what are the chains about? Yeah, why are they going to go to the chains? Have they been chained down? Maybe. But oh, why? Like, did know, they get sound. caught up in like something? And were they on a construction site? And they, like, <laughs> are these are these ghost chains the same as a ghost? I.e., can the chain go through you like a ghost goes through? Like, what That's is the what physics of this? Are they metaphor? Right. Is it metaphor? Like, I'm waited. I'm I'm held to death. Like, I don't know. I, I think it's so a little bit of a metaphor. You're chained yeah. still to earth. You're not yes. allowed to be released to heaven be free. to do whatever you need to do. But you're right, I have never thought about why you'd be dragging around some heavy, ugly chains. Cause it's scary. <laughs> that just means, that's just short hands, but he dead. No, but see, this is the question. <laughs> he dead though, cause he got, he dead. He it's got true. Changed. It's really dead. This is a dead. question a kid would ask, right? So this is part of like, when I was there, I was asking those things. I was like, wait, question. Are we time traveling here? Are there different dimensions? <laughs> what is, what are the, what are the, what are the rules? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things that I think getting back to your idea of poor TYA theater, the thing that upsets me the most and I see the most often in poorly made TYA theater is they don't respect the rules of the world. They set up the rules of the world and they don't respect them. And I think often they don't respect them because they think something gets too hard or scary. But like you said, we take kids to Christmas Carol, we read them the Bible, you know, like the talk about scary stories, teen suicide, Romeo and Juliet. So I think that we have to not be afraid to really be true to the rules of the world when creating it. And if something bad happens, it's going to happen. But then you have an opportunity. The scary thing is an opportunity to teach a coping skill, like Karen was saying, right? They, all those things that you think you have to take out of TYA, with some exceptions for like developmental differences at different ages, but everything you have to teach think you have to take out is actually an opportunity and I wish people would see it that way 
It's the Mr. Or, Rogers of it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was, that the other was thing whole... is, there's things allowed in TV and movies that we're not allowed to do. Yes. In theater, like <laughs> Harry Potter is a baby that was almost murdered, and his parents were murdered, right? He's and, got a thing. And he's got a thing from it, thing. and they're all like, and he's living with terrible people who are abusing him. And we all think because the world building is so great, but if we had come to a theater with the original idea of Harry Potter and said, guys, I have this idea of an orphan baby whose parents have been murdered during a war, that he has a scar and, is, and there's going to be all the, they would say no. They would say oh, no, we not deal with that. And I'm like, why is the idea of it being alive and active? Why do we have to be a lot, there's so much more handholding in a sense, when all of this literature and all of these other movies get a, a, you know, Little Mermaid, I mean, death of the mom or, or I mean even Nemo the, his mom gets eaten by somebody in the first two minutes right so oh, one of the great one of the great yeah. stories yeah, and that's I why Nemo. I love it and I love invoking Pixar I'm pitching if someone's asked me to come in to pitch to adapt something for them that I because if I can show them sometimes in the pitch that connection between oh we do this in Pixar they did it in this movie or Christmas Carol or whatever that they're yeah. familiar with um, then I can get it past them sometimes but yeah. we have to build that context for them because for some reason a lot of TYA producers cannot put it in that that context themselves mm -hmm. and that drives me banana crackers <sighs> Like that just drives yeah. me nuts. What do y'all, um, in the last like 15 minutes, what about hopes for the future of TYA? And like, if we could make the great stuff, I mean, I would love to see more of that. What the experiment, I think that was very successful at Peter Pan. What are like main stage, big ass, beautiful productions that everybody can go to and that are riveting and funny and accessible enough that you can take that six-year-old and you can take your 90-year-old and we can all kind of come out being like, oh, it's great. <laughs> you know, that would be my 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 dream. What about what's what's on your mind? Um, I, I'm living in that space right now all the time. Um, this this moment that we find ourselves is is exciting as hell to me uh, because um, it's it's reshuffle, it's forcing, it's reshuffling everything. Like it's, it's, we've got to now kind of re, we have an opportunity to do some, some, some really long awaited infrastructural work. Um, and we have an opportunity. And so me, myself, um, I, I am trying to like write those solid pieces like, and be understood by anybody that are not, you know, that are still specific, uh, but have just multiple points of entry um and, and you know that that's kind of what the, the challenge that i'm putting on myself but i'm also having more fun the stuff's better in my opinion um yeah and and yeah so that's where i'm living what about you karen two minds about it like yes i really do want the larger regional theaters to kind of embrace the family show and embrace new new work yeah. and do exactly like i loved your peter pan at shakespeare theater. it was just beautiful but i also want to tip my hat and honor those theaters that have dedicated themselves to children's work from the beginning yeah. um, and that's what they've been doing and they offer classes and all of that so I, it's almost like a bridge finding some kind of bridge or something that doesn't hold those theaters in less esteem than the original theaters so I I want to work I want to work at both of them yeah. in different ways and I and I and what their, those roles are in some way I want people to go at night to the children's theater too yeah. um, and have the regional theater going here because it really is been like child's play and imagination stage and you know first stage and all of these theaters like Idris has been working at that have put been at the forefront of pushing new material out there so I I, I want both I want yes and um, I want yes and uh, in different ways and I also want parents because to be open to take up your child to play that you don't know the title of I find you're here uh, and uh, so many times theaters do want to do new work, but if they don't know the book that, you know, if it's not associated with a caterpillar or something like that, 
they feel like it doesn't sell. And so I, I do my, it, it's not that the theaters don't want to do it. I just want to urge parents, just like you need something new. You don't need it. it the idea of taking risks with your children um, is something that I want from every audience member, both, you know, so that's something that I would love to talk about more in a, in a cultural way. And I don't know how you do it. And, you know, uh, reviews, if, if your theater doesn't review plays written by, you know, for young people, then it keeps escalating and it just has to be reviewed as an art form because that's you have right. real artists, you have real artists writing and performing in them. I mean, Jackie, you, you have thoughts. Exactly yeah, I know, right? This is part of the whole I'm thing, saying, like, yeah. yeah. The tyranny of the title, right? The tyranny of the title. And adaptation and the necessity and, of adaptation. Yes. And I'm very lucky. I live in Philadelphia and the art theater here in Philly does full scale, full length children's shows that they usually have to commission because there aren't that many of them out there. Laura and I am sure they will do your Peter Pan soon. Because <laughs> sure, cause not only is it wonderful, but there aren't many out there. So it's it's so wonderful that you wrote that. Um, but yeah, Karen, what you're saying, what we what what we call it. Philly is the tyranny of the title. And so my thought is what if, right? If we're making, we decide to make original children's work, but we work with an illustrator. So we actually create a short children's book version that we email out and just an e-blast to all of the subscribers and to make it available freely. And then go, now you've seen the book version, come see it on stage. Oh my God, that's so smart. And then mm -hmm. we are generating the tyranny of the title. Like we're overcoming it by, you know, whatever you call it, doing the same thing. And um, creating like superstars out of the characters already. So the kids will be looking and be like, already. that's blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You send the costume pattern, right? Like yeah. on your cape, put this, whatever you want. But the even the Arden, which is a brilliant theater overall and does gorgeous children's shows, um, even they, like, if there's shows that are not known titles, they have trouble attracting audiences. And it's a shame because they're gorgeous and lovely and make you think about new things and bring new stories to the stage. So I think that there has to be a way that we can make parents comfortable enough with it on the front end and kids excited enough to come. We just have to figure out yeah. what the heck that way is. Yeah, Jackie, what you're, what you're talking about, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, uh, straddling the line between, you know, playwright, but also um, artistic director. And this is, this is something that I think a lot about too, is that we've got to be as intentional and creative and put as much resources into the delivery system and, and the, the, the ringmastering, like the ring mat, like the circus, like those, there's a, there's a science that I love the circus too, because it's the perfect, like the perfect formula, which is like, everybody comes out, the parade comes out, here's everybody you gonna see. And then the ringmaster is there to set you up to, to make sure it, 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 it matters. And so sometimes we just get too much in the theater, too much focused on the play and the actors and the costumes. And it's like, no, you gotta, you gotta build that bridge especially now, right? It's, it's, it's not that folk are unenlightened or this, that, the third, it's just, they just it, it, there's only so many hours in the day and they gonna go with what they know. So make, so to your point, make sure they know what it is. Like, you, like that's the job, right? Like let them know what it is. And there's a science and an art form to that too. And I think that that's the responsibility um, on theaters themselves. Um, th you know, cause you know, I've, I've heard the tyranny of the title for years now on the other side of it and I'm just like well then to your point like well how do we if it's about a book then let's just make it a book first yeah <laughs> you know what I'm saying like because we've okay, got the illustrations book. don't Here's cost that much we don't have they to really publish can. it mm -hmm. and you already yeah. have the writer you can just write the little outline and and you know more extensive time. trailers you know more extensive yes. <laughs> interviews so that a kid, I mean, I would love to see one that was to a kid. Like if I at the playwright could be like, hi, I'm Lauren, I wrote this play. Let me tell you a little bit about it because I really want you to come. And then a kid would hear it be like, oh my God, she wants me to come, that's great. <laughs> yeah, and you know who did that was Mo Willems yes, for the Kennedy yes. Center. And, and big was, shout out to the Kennedy Center. They have done big so out. much original new theater for young audiences. I know almost all of us or maybe all of us have all, have worked there and they are just such a source of 
of great generation in this in this movie. So, yes, sorry, Jackie. Yes, no, it's okay. I just discovered the reaction button, so this is what's going to happen all the time now. Um, okay. <laughs> I know, um, but the Kennedy Center they did yeah. such a great. Oh, this is awesome. Um, they did such a great job. They made Mo Willems did these like three or four minute videos you could watch with your kid before and after you came. And it talked about his process. And he talked all about how if you sit and write a story and you draw, you are a writer and you are an illustrator and you can make your books at any age. And it was incredibly empowering. It gave a little bit of insight into process. It gave a lot of encouragement. It gave, there were vocabulary, were there three vocabulary words each session? So you were learning a new word, but they were short. And I have to tell you, my kids responded brilliantly because it's so exciting to see the actual artist. How often do kids actually get to see that? They get to see the actors sometimes. But like the person who actually made it. So I think any of those things, I think the Kennedy Center has created a lovely model with the Mo Willems residency mm -hmm. of how we could possibly do that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, as we we're approaching the hour, maybe just some last thoughts about this amazing field, which I feel like we just started getting into awesome stuff about it. Um, but maybe also thinking that there's a lot of writers watching this and maybe ha taking this moment in time to work on that theater for audience's play or that pitch and maybe some like practical nitty gritty advice. I mean, I will just offer one thing that um, beware of the audience interaction because you can do it too much and then you can't get those little audiences back. <laughs> we had one in one of our musicals where they were a part of like a nuclear explosion or some sort of like science experiment thing. And it just, it took like five solid minutes to get their attention back. So use it sparingly, use it wisely and have like a big song number right after it so you can get everyone's attention. Again. <laughs> okay, practical, practical advice <laughs> for writing. Uh, real quick, I, I'll say that um, uh, just just to echo again, um, Susan uh, Susan Zeter, like don't don't try to write for kids. Just write about kids and write about the same. I mean, you know, human beings, we got the same desires. You know what I'm saying? So just just and and like and you know, I always when I started writing plays, I was like, I'm just gonna write the stuff that I would actually want to go see. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like stop. Stop presuming to know how kids are, what they think, you know what I mean? Just write a good story, yo. Like, just write a good story. Keep it moving, keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? Keep mm -hmm. it active, you know what I'm saying? Be interesting, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, just write good. And authentic, because you know? kids can sniff authentic. out if you're not being yeah, real. Just don't, but I just implore you, like, do not write in that, like, hey, kids, you wanna go on a magical, like, just put a pillow yeah. over the face of that voice. <laughs> Yes. Jackie, do you have some some practical writing for kids advice? Yeah, I would yes and all of that. I think it's great. Um, also, think about a lot of times people think that because of the tyranny of the title or because an artistic director wants a specific type of character that they have to write a specific type of play. No. Remember, the kids are going to be happy to see the whatever, to see the princess, to see the mermaid. You can tell whatever story you want whatever story you want. So even if we're putting some of those iconic, some would say overdone characters, you don't have to tell the same stories that have always been told with those characters. You can say something new. You can re-envision them in a way that the kids are excited to see their favorite mermaid on stage, but also there's a whole new journey or part of the story they've never heard, it's never been told. So just give yourself permission to be free. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have two, uh, two pieces of advice, and it's the same one I use for my adult plays. Why this play now? Mm -hmm. Why are you telling this story now? Because the same thing applies uh, to young people as it does to adults, and that's that sense. And what are the three choices that your char main character is making? Can you name three of them right away? Because if you can't, then you might have some protagonist issues. Um, and uh, the last one is if you're actually writing uh, a play that is about young people and for young people, are there young people in your, um, and I don't mean young, but is it, is, are there young characters in your play? Um, and this is sometimes the issue I have uh, with, weirdly, with Shrek, 
um, sometimes hmm. uh, because I'm like, wow, there, there, are, there are no, there's not one child. Interesting. In, in, in that, that's all adult issues that we're playing. And it's very entertaining, but sometimes I look at Shrek and I'm like, oh, this is adult problems made in the cartoon version for kids because they fart and belch, et cetera. But, yeah. but, but I've had yeah. that issue and I, that's kind of controversial feeling, but I'm like, oh, so weird to go to, you know, cause Nemo's a, a child, right? There's that's anyway. so smart. So that's, had, that was the issue with that play when I was explaining to them, I was like, why are my kids not getting into this? And it's because it's about like love and, and, and marriage and this, and I mean, you know, the, the princess. I'm ugly, what is beautiful. Yeah. What is, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, and there's ish, there's themes in it that are good, but I I, I haven't I don't think I don't think Shrek is is you know, I, I think it's an, an adult play discussed you know whatever it is it's it's not it's entertaining. But even I the donkey like gets with the dragon, and I was like maybe the donkey's the kid. No, the donkey's not the kid. He's like having babies with a dragon. That's right. <laughs> That I know, him, that's, my, that's, my, that's my controversial statement. I <laughs> love it. I love it. Yeah, um, you heard it here first. Zacharias hate Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I keep looking at it. And I'm like, why does this not feel authentic to me? That is, um, yeah, that's a great point. I'm not learning a point of view. the parents. Yeah, yeah. Those, that movie's for the parent. That's for the parent. That's totally for the parent. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, up because you made me think immediately that movie up. Uh, but yeah. there's that there's that very adorable. Uh, yeah. boy boy scout in that, oh, in that a, right and there's a dog and, there, and the there's dog. other ways and there's a dog and it starts and and up the 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 ed, the ed asner character we see him first as, as a kid a yeah. 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 yeah yeah in like the most beautifully sad 10 minutes oh, of done, cinema yeah, ever so beautiful on that note this? of being beautiful and sad. Um, no thank you so much for this amazing conversation uh it was more <laughs> than i that i even imagined um, we are all such incredible geniuses, um, both in theater for young audiences and in main stage theater. And it's just such a gift to be alive at the same time as your amazing work. Thank you for what you do. And um, yeah, this is great. I'll, um, to everybody watching, I'll go in and look at some of the comments and maybe I can bug some of our amazing guests to do answer some if there's specific questions you have for them. Um, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank Any you, other Lauren, ideas? Thank you so yeah. much, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. See you all soon, well, maybe. You all. Bye, Idris. Bye, Karen. Bye, Bye everyone. Stay yeah. sane. <laughs> Bye.